Hi, I'm Ryan Baker, and this is Big Data in Education, 10th Anniversary Edition. Today, we'll discuss algorithmic bias in education. So what is algorithmic bias? One classical definition comes from Friedman and Niesenbaum, who say that biased computer systems systematically and unfairly discriminate against individuals or groups of individuals in favor of others. A working definition that I like, uh, for obvious reasons, is Baker and Hahn 2022, which is cases where model performance is substantially better or worse across mutually exclusive groups separated by non-malleable factors. A non-malleable factor being something that someone, for example, in a school system can't realistically change about a student, such as their race or where they live. So where does algorithmic bias come from? So one way to understand where algorithmic bias can come from is to look at the machine learning life cycle, where we start at the top right with the actual world state, um, how things actually are. We determine something that we want to predict or infer, we collect a measurement or data for it, we build a model to, uh, based on that measurement and data to make the prediction, and then we deploy it in the real world um, to drive some intervention. Now that intervention changes the actual world which starts the entire cycle over again. A lot of algorithmic bias, and what I'll talk about today, comes from two steps. One of them is the actual learning of the model, and Kizilchek and Lee have a really nice review of that. And the other comes from the data and the measurement that we put in the model, and Baker and Hahn have a review of that. A key form of how bias can develop from measurement and data collection is representational bias, where the model performs less well for groups less well represented and the data used to develop the models. For example, a model mostly developed using data from suburban middle-class learners might then be used in an urban setting, and it might not work as well there. Now, people will sometimes say, I don't need to worry about that because I've got the full data. I'm not sampling. Well, that's great. But even a complete data set might not be enough if a specific group of interest is rarely seen in that data set. So how do we measure algorithmic bias? There's three broad approaches to doing this. The first is to test by group. We build the model and validate it initially with everybody, and then we try to take it by groups and split out the groups and say, how well does the model work for each group we currently have data on? A second approach is to cross-validate by group, where we um, build the model on some groups and then apply it to other groups and test on those groups. And this is a good approach for estimating how well a model works for groups that we don't yet have data for. A third approach is metrics that explicitly compare group performance to each other. In terms of metrics that compare groups to each other, there's three broad paradigms. Independence, which looks at whether there's statistical independence between the classifier's outcomes and group membership. The idea being that if the classifier's outcomes are dependent on group membership, you've got a problem. The second is separation, which says that an algorithm's decision has got to be independent of the group membership, conditional on the true outcomes. And the third is sufficiency, where true outcomes must be independent of protected attributes, conditional on the algorithmic decisions. Some metrics in the broader category of independence include demographic parity, where you take the difference of the probability of a classifier's prediction given membership in the group of concern and the probability of getting that same prediction if you're not in the group of concern. You take the difference of them and you take the absolute value. Another one is disparate impact, where you take the probability of getting um, the prediction based on membership in the group of concern, and you divide it by the probability of getting the prediction based on not belonging to that group. In the second paradigm, separation, uh, we have metrics such as a broca, which is the area of difference between ROC curves. And a broca is not simply just taking the two ROC values and subtracting them. Because for example, let's say that for low risk students, the model does really well with group A and badly with group B, but for high risk students, the model is really well with group B and not group A, that's gonna have a very high broca, even if the AUC ROCs are the same. A second metric based on separation is equal opportunity, which takes the difference of, first, the probability of getting a certain prediction based both on the um, membership in the group and getting the better outcome, and the probability of getting that prediction based on not being in the group and the better outcome, and you take the absolute value of that difference. And a third metric based on separation is equalized odds, which is equal opportunity averaged across all the possible outcomes. Finally, for sufficiency, what we often see 
is a metric that's just simply called efficiency, which you calculate by taking the probability of the better outcome given the classifier's prediction and membership in the group of concern, and you take the difference between that and the probability of the better outcome based on getting that same prediction and uh, non-membership non in the group of concern. You subtract those two, take the absolute value. Other paradigms, and for a fuller discussion, see Kizilchek and Lee, include similarity-based fairness, where you look for similar outcomes for students who are similar on features other than the, the demographic variable, and counterfactual fairness, where you look to see whether you would get the same outcome for the student if they're changed to a different demographic group, which typically you're going to see this one when you're actually doing something like using a demographic variable as a predictor, which is not something that I'd recommend. But metrics alone don't tell us the full story, because even if we establish that our algorithm is fair for our labels that we have, what if we don't trust these labels? And you say, wait, how can I not trust my labels? Like, if I can't trust my labels, what do I do? And this comes down to measurement bias, which occurs when we've got biases in our training examples used to develop the models. For example, judgment by other people might uh, involve biases. Uh, your coders might be looking at two people and using their unconscious biases when they make the labels. Um, you might have this in judgments by people themselves. Really, any time human beings are responsible for a decision, you have some risk of bias. And this includes so-called natural variables. For example, um, you might build a model to predict uh, suspension from school, but suspension from school is itself governed by biases in the decisions of who gets suspended. So, okay, we've talked a little about the sources of potential algorithmic bias in education. What do we know about the bias impacting learners in common demographic categories? Um, in fact, we don't know as much as we'd like to. Holstein and colleagues note that industrial teams often struggle to anticipate what subpopulations are impacted and what forms of unfairness they experience for specific kinds of machine learning applications. And most educational data mining research doesn't even mention learner demographics, much less investigate algorithmic bias in terms of it. Uh, see a review by Luc Paquette. But we do know a little bit, and I'd like to give a brief summary of evidence on algorithmic bias in education. And for full details as of 2021, an eternity to go for this stuff, see our article in the International Journal of Artificial Intelligence and Education. And for the very most up-to-date info, see our wiki at this link. Race and ethnicity. Several papers show that educational prediction algorithms perform worse for African-American students and Latino students than students in other groups. And this includes predictions of grades, course failure, graduation, and dropout. However, other types of algorithms, like automated essay scoring and self-regulated learning detectors, have been found to be largely unbiased. It's worth noting, by the way, that um, in the United States, there's almost never enough data to test for biases impacting Native American learners, although see Christy Dahl 2019. Now, as an important note, and I foreshadowed this a minute ago, many people argue for predicting explicitly based on race, but first of all, doing so can actually make the model less accurate in Renja Yu's work. And second of all, it can replicate biases and decisions being made by the instructors. And third of all, as Feathers noted, it can lead to blatantly discriminatory algorithms that make predictions based almost entirely on race. For an unbalanced, in-depth discussion of this issue, see our preprint, um, which um, you can find on the web. And as a note on our note, not including demographic variables as predictors is sometimes referred to as quote-unquote fairness through unawareness. But other variables can often secretly act as proxies for demographic variables, so fairness through unawareness is by itself insufficient. In my opinion, it's a good start, uh, especially if you're then testing for algorithmic bias, but it's not enough always. Gender. There's been mixed, complicated results for gender, and it's been studied several times. Sometimes models seem to be biased against female students, and sometimes models seem to be biased against male students. Nationality. On a test of foreign language proficiency, one system inaccurately gave Arabic and Hindi-speaking students lower scores than human essay raters. In another example, models of help-seeking built using data from learners in the Philippines, Costa Rica, and the United States were each more accurate on students from their own countries than for students from other countries. And curiously, Costa Rica was much more the outlier here than the other two countries.
And in a third example, models predicting standardized examination scores trained on data from the USA were more accurate for students in economically developed countries than students in less economically developed countries. And there's also evidence for algorithmic bias in education in terms of other categories like socioeconomic status, native language, disabilities, urbanicity, parental educational background, and even whether a student has a parent in the military. But there's still insufficient research about bias impacting other groups, and I would say that we don't even know about all the groups that are impacted at this point. The majority of empirical evidence for algorithmic bias in education has been published by researchers in the US, it's sad to say, and we need a lot more work to learn more about algorithmic bias worldwide. I've gotten a critique by reviewers a couple times in my review articles for being US-centric, but the truth is that it's not really that we're trying to be US-centric, it's that the field is US-centric. We need much more work about algorithmic bias in the rest of the world. There's been a decent amount increasingly in Europe, but there's been surprisingly little in Asia or Africa or Latin America. Other takeaways from our survey. Models trained on one group of learners generally perform more poorly for new groups. Not surprising. There's been relatively little investigation of bias for many groups, and this is one of these cases where I really hope that this lecture will quickly become embarrassingly out of date. But I only know of one study involving indigenous learners as of this recording. I don't know of any involving non-standard dialects or specific disabilities or non-binary and transgender learners or religious minorities. We need, um, we need to know who's being impacted and how and when. And we know that if we do collect and train on a diverse sample of learners, our models are less biased. So, and that leads us to how can we address algorithmic bias? The answer is, first, we have to have better data, which actually is representative of students and which has demographic variables, though not as predictors. And then we have to actually check for algorithmic bias, and then we have to actually try to fix it. There's a good discussion of methods for how to fix it in Kizilcheck and Lee 2022. One approach that's worth uh, considering is data rebalancing. If one group is much less common than another in the data set, we can use methods like SMOTE or data cloning to create a more balanced data set. Now, this can only address biases due to unbalanced data, but that's a big part of it. There's also cost-sensitive classification, which I mentioned uh, earlier in this class, not this session, but a previous session. What you can do is overweight errors on data points from groups where the model performs less well. And this can be used to improve the balance of model accuracy between groups of learners. And there's some demonstrations of the usefulness of this approach for algorithmic bias, including one example in education by Vasquez Verdugo and colleagues. Another approach is adversarial learning. In adversarial learning, one algorithm predicts what you want to predict, and another, called the adversary, tries to predict the sensitive attribute from the algorithm's output. And the idea is you then retrain the main prediction algorithm to make the adversary less effective at being able to figure out the sensitive attribute from the output. The techniques for addressing algorithmic bias are getting better all the time, and I'm utterly certain that I will be re-recording this video in the next edition of this course because it's changing so quickly. And that's a great thing. I'm happy to see that. So this ends week two of Big Day in Education. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.